So, hello, greetings. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Thomas Daffin here again. And today is the last recording of my talks um, this year, 2019, which has been, as the Queen said, a pretty bumpy ride. I've been fasting every Sunday since the beginning of the year. That's a whole year. And I will continue to, as long as uh, Brexit continues to loom over the UK as a threat and its um, breakup uh, is assured if Brexit goes ahead. I'm still appealing to the common sense and wisdom of my fellow compatriots to prevent this crisis. And I will be continuing to fast until that happens. Um, now, last week I spoke to Boris Johnson on the phone. I tried to explain to him, uh, man to man, you know, as a philosopher and intellectual, why I felt that he had the intellectual intelligence to realise the catastrophe that he's poised on the edge of committing. I know he's had to lie and cheat and bully his way into power, but now he's got power. I counselled him to use it wisely and to prevent Brexit. I know some of his followers would, you know, bark, betrayal, etc. But if he actually listens to his conscience and says, look, I'm a one nation Tory, I put the survival of my country ahead of everything, the well-being of my fellow citizens, my duty to my monarch, etc. I mean, does he want to hand on to the monarch a broken Britain, um, with Scotland and Northern Ireland breaking away from the UK, as will happen with Brexit? Uh, or, like, you know, fighting and riots and chaos? Um, <clears throat> well, anyway, I appealed to his conscience as a good man when I spoke to him on the phone last week, and I'm waiting to hear, um, you know, he's gone off to his Pyrrhus Island to think about it all. Um, <clears throat> Now this week I've decided it's it's important to follow up that phone call with a with a, a phone call with his line manager, and of course that is Queen Elizabeth herself. Um, I will be speaking to her shortly. I've, I've pre-booked a call, and that is fantastic. I mean it was amazing that I got through to the palace, um, <clears throat> and uh, managed to book a call. Okay, so before I ring, um, <clears throat> the time is you know fast approaching. But before I do that, I want to read out. A letter that you see, I've I've exchanged correspondence with Her Majesty over Brexit before, and um, <clears throat> in August I had a reply from the palace um, to a letter I wrote expressing my very great concern about Brexit to her because I I've always regarded myself as a loyal citizen um, of the UK. I'm a Canadian dual citizen. I've loved Britain ever since I was a child. We came back to Britain um, from Canada, where I was born. The Queen has always been a sort of fabulous figure of unity and, and so on. Because I'm a baptised Anglican, she is the head of the church to me. So I, I, I approach her with great reverence and affection. I've never personally exchanged words with her, but I've been in her presence at a couple of important meetings. Um, <clears throat> And the most important, really, was when I was invited to Westminster Abbey to the Commonwealth Interfaith um, Celebration, Commonwealth Day Observance, way back in, I think it was 1997. Um, and I was there as an interfaith leader. I was active in peace work. I was doing my PhD on interfaith peacemaking. And so it was a great honour to be in Westminster Abbey, um, and hear sermons and speeches and readings by Buddhists, Sikhs, Hindus, Christians uh, from Catholic, Anglican and Church of Scotland. And um, it was Westminster Abbey at its best. Now, I knew a little bit about what was going on behind the scenes. I was privy to a few of the internal you know, bits of information. And, um, yeah, so uh, um, she came into the Abbey at the very end of this amazing procession of Commonwealth young people. Each nation of the Commonwealth with a flag had come in um, with some people dressed in their costume. Um, and to me, it was just an awesome experience, really, because as a Canadian, I've always taken pride in the Commonwealth. I love the Commonwealth. I think we should be doing more for peace. I think we should be doing more for justice around the world. I worked with a great Sikh academic at the time, Dr. Jagdish Gundara, who was my PhD advisor. He was um, Indian, but he was brought up in Uganda. He was kicked out by the crazy Idi Amin, came to London, worked at the Centre for Multicultural Education, where I was based and founded my institute. 
he was a typical sort of intellectual giant from Commonwealth background. He did part of his degree at McGill University in Canada, where I was born, before doing um, his PhD at the University of Edinburgh. So anyway, that was a really important experience for me, and I was uh, as close to Her Majesty, you know, down walking down the aisle of, of Westminster Abbey. Um, and I was struck by her presence. She's a very short woman, tiny little woman, but tremendous power in there. I felt a tremendous power for goodness. And gosh, you know, um, 53 nations, including some of the biggest in the world, it's not a small job she has as head of the Commonwealth. And her mission was to bring peace to all the religions, right? In, throughout the Commonwealth. So, <clears throat> um, and that was my PhD thesis, was how we can bring peace to the religions of the world, actually, and not just the Commonwealth. And I used to have meetings at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in, in London University at the time. In 91, I'd founded my Institute of Peace Studies at the University of London and I was then developing the work. You know, I was directing this institute and with the help of numerous scholars from around the world, not least in India, I'd been to India in 93 for the first time and uh, had gone back a couple of times. And I created a multi-faith mediation service that I was now writing up. Uh, eventually, I was to write that up for my PhD thesis, which was uh, examined at the University of London. And all the details are in there. I mean, if you're interested, it's been published as well. Um, <clears throat> I also met um, Prince Philip during this time in the uh, mid, mid to late 90s. I was secretary, I was secretary uh, sorry, I was a trustee of a thing called the International Sacred Literature Trust, which was publishing faith works in modern English translation. And we met at St. James's Palace, and I had a long talk to Philip, who was struck me as a very intellectual, very good man. And I think they're a great couple. Um, I've never been disloyal to, to you know, my, my queen and my king, as I regard them. Um, however, I've been very dismayed since then, really, um, at the way the world has been going. And now I'm utterly dismayed by Brexit, as colleagues know, um, <clears throat> because it seems to me we've, we've come from, gosh, you know, <laughs> a, a world where everything seemed possible, where every, peace genuinely seemed possible in, in the 90s. We thought um, that with um, the Treaty of Paris being signed in 1990, the end of the Cold War, that we could build a peaceful Europe. We could play our role in that as a European nation as well as a Commonwealth nation and help build, build peace in a, a wider world. Um, <clears throat> and now it seems to me that the UK is in danger of breaking up. Europe is threatened by Brexit. Um, all kinds of malevolent forces are abreast in the world, and I just am utterly dismayed at that. So it's, it's quite important, this phone call. I want to talk to Her Majesty and see if she can just catch up, really. We haven't, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot going on here. Now, she wrote back to me. I warned her in writing, and I've shared that letter previously in a previous talk. I read it out. Um, and she wrote back to me on the 7th of August in 2018, that's last year, um, saying, Dear Dr. Daffin, this was through her deputy correspondence coordinator, so someone in the palace that deals with it. It's on Buckingham Palace note paper. Dear Dr. Daffin, I've been asked to write and thank you for your letter of the 28th of June 2018 to the Queen, from which careful note has been taken of the views you express regarding the UK's departure from its membership of the European Union. <coughs> Well, it is interesting to know of your views, and by the way, of course, I warned the Queen that it would lead to the breakup of the UK and constant uh, dislocation and chaos and uh, serious problems, including probable resumption of conflict in Ireland, etc., um, <clears throat> etc. Et um, the letter goes on to say, whilst it's interesting to know of your views, I must explain that as a constitutional sovereign... Her Majesty acts on the advice of her ministers and remains strictly non-political at all times. These are therefore not matters on which the Queen would personally comment. Yours sincerely. <clears throat> OK, so I, I was happy to get the letter because A, it meant that the Queen had actually read it. I don't think that letter would have been sent to me if the Queen hadn't read my views. So I don't think this is just the Deputy Correspondence Coordinator saying, you know, thanks for your views, but... 
I'm not sharing them with the Queen. No, I think she'd read them. Um, <clears throat> and perhaps in some, you know, uh, distant recesses of her mind, my name is known to her. Um, so, not least, because I've also exchanged correspondence with her on a couple of other occasions. So, after that meeting in Westminster Abbey in 97, I think it was, I got so inspired by it, I looked and asked and said, you know, where is the Commonwealth Interfaith Network? Who's trying to build good faith relations in the Commonwealth? And there wasn't one. Nobody was doing it. Apart from that one annual event where the Commonwealth faith leaders come together and the Queen always hosts it. It's not always in Westminster Abbey. It is sometimes in different cities throughout the Commonwealth, even. Not always in Britain. Um, so I... OK, that's a one-off thing once a year. But what about a, a, a council to keep that work going? Surely building good faith relations throughout the Commonwealth is a matter of great importance. So I took it upon myself, having researched it and discovering nobody was doing it, to launch such a thing in later in 97. Um, and there was an opportunity at the Council of um, Heads of Government of Commonwealth Countries, uh, Chogham it's called, which met in Edinburgh that year. And I went to Edinburgh and I booked a venue at New College in the University of Edinburgh, uh, right in the city centre, and invited lots of different faith leaders from Commonwealth countries to come and speak. And we had a very successful meeting which launched this uh, Commonwealth Common Values Council, sometimes known as the Commonwealth Interfaith Council. I spoke at the same time, I had a private meeting set up with the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Chief Anya Uku, who was a wonderful Ar African charismatic thinker and intellectual and leader. And he said, Thomas, this is a brilliant idea, I will back you, you must set this up, fantastic. Um, uh, call it the Commonwealth Common Values Council. And I realise now, with hindsight, the wisdom of this, because... <laughs> We need to stress the common values. There's no point having a common interfaith council where everyone's just bitching and arguing with each other. Um, we need to, to bring people together, whatever their faith, whether they're Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, you know, all the common faiths of mankind, um, including the secularists, the humanists, you know, the atheists, I would say even they should be part of the big tent because they're commonwealth citizens too. My mother was a Marxist, some kind of a agnostic or atheist. Well, she had values. She had a humanist set of values derived from Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre, and so on, Gramsci, you know, the, the liberal left. And there are many brilliant people, intellectuals, that can give a lot and do give a lot to Commonwealth society who come from that tradition. So, yeah, bring it on. Let them, let them be invited to the table. So that was what inspired me. I set up the Commonwealth Common Values Council. We held, we've held various meetings. I published newsletters and, um, you know, I wish I could have done more. Uh, we've not received proper funding, sadly, and um, therefore it's been difficult. But I've always flied that flag and therefore I have corresponded a bit with, with the Queen ever since. I did write and inform her of what I've done. Um, and the then Prime Minister, who was Tony Blair, who wrote back a warm letter saying, great, you know, good job. It's very interesting that Tony Blair then himself got very inspired to set up, after he stopped being Prime Minister, he pioneered work in interfaith peace relations. So maybe I was influential in somehow sparking him, look, this is the direction to take Tony when, when you stop being Prime Minister. Um, yeah, historians in the future can work that out. But here we are, and like me, he's been utterly against Brexit because a man of that calibre who's seen world events from the stratosphere level, like John Major, they know what Brexit means for the future of our country and the Commonwealth. So, OK, so anyway, I got that letter 27th of August last year. I thought about it a long time, and it took me some months to get the impetus to reply and I finally replied on the 26th of January 2019 it took me ages right um and I wrote back to her and I'm going to share before I pick up the phone and talk to her I'm going to share the text that I sent her because she's got that letter you don't know dear listeners um what I wrote and I feel a duty to share that now <clears throat> um because it wasn't an easy letter to write 
It's not going to be easy to um, to read out, but it has to be done. Um, so that, you know, when I speak to the Queen, you, you realise what's at stake here. Um, <clears throat> and I don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel. Right, so what I said was as follows. <clears throat> Dear Queen Elizabeth II, further to my previous letter of the 28th of June, in which I warned of the likely consequences of Brexit and the breakup of the UK with the secession of Scotland and the reunification of Ireland as an independent republic, as well as the impoverishment of the people of the remaining parts of England and Wales, you kindly replied in August and thanked me for expressing my views. In that letter, I stated various things. I am forced to write again, however, because the Prime Minister, then Theresa May, shows again no sign of listening to these facts of reality. Um, you've told me in your letter there is nothing you can do. I'm going to sort of summarise. You can read the whole thing if you want in my book of letters, which uh, has been published. It's a book of correspondence, um, which I've been working on over for the last few years. Um, you've told me in your letter there's nothing you can do, and in effect that as a constitutional monarch, you are duty-bound to follow the instruction of the leader of the largest party in the House of Commons, <clears throat> who has the right simply to insist you do whatever they want and to override any views you may have yourself. With all due respect, I am duty-bound to point out this is not strictly true. We are all bound by our own consciousness and by our own conscience and by our loyalty to the cosmic codes of honour, duty, truth and divine law, as have been all previous generations of human beings who have ever walked on earth. All monarchs who have ever ruled are also duty bound to uphold these spiritual laws in the light of which they themselves were anointed and ruled. In your case, the spiritual laws of Christianity, which are based on love, as you so eloquently make the point year after year in your Christmas addresses to the Commonwealth. To allow or permit any Prime Minister to willingly implement a policy which is causing massive suffering to the people of the UK, including those many UK citizens who now live in Europe, as well as EU citizens who live in the UK, and to implement an ill-thought-out policy which will result in massive destabilisation to our nation, which will lead to the withdrawal of Scotland from the UK, which will lead to the people of Northern Ireland leaving the UK, although this may be accompanied by a resumption of violence even, is, with all due respect, going entirely contrary to your actual duties as a Queen. There is always an unwritten covenant between a monarch and his or her subjects, overseen by the divine. I am writing to you as a loyal Anglican Christian layman, but also as an Archdruid. Indeed, the Archdruid of both the UK and Europe when it comes to peace. My concern is that the Prime Minister's actions are going to precipitate untold future violence on the UK. And that is why we must share a common commitment to preventing it. You might say to me, I have no authority to write to you. I'm simply a citizen with no political or economic power. And you must do what your Prime Minister tells you. But I would say that your right to rule as monarch stems from the divine realms and that whereas the British Isles have been Christian for nearly 2,000 years, for approximately 10,000 years of settled habitation before that time, they were a Druid land. And thus I am writing with the authority of those accumulated previous 12,000 years of history, custom and law behind my words. I would beg you, therefore, to listen carefully. In the ancient law of Britain, if a monarch acted against cosmic law, the Druid council had the right to request them to resign and abdicate, 
and to replace them with another monarch who can actually discern that cosmic law more properly. I've always thought that you were a good and true monarch to your people. But in not standing up to this willfully, morally blind and future ignorant Prime Minister, forgive my frankness, but I am duty bound to speak the truth, and the hard right wing of the Conservative Party, you were dangerously close to colluding in an act of national vandalism that is frankly toxic to the future well-being of all your people and your own descendants. Do you not care about the impact this will have on the poor, the homeless, the less fortunate, the disabled, the unemployed? Do you have no compassion as monarch for the horrendous backward step that leaving the EU will have for the rights of workers and all the less well-off people in society? In ancient times, the greatest monarchs of all lands have always made it a habit to walk incognito amongst their subjects and to find out how they actually live and what kinds of problems they were facing. I think it is time this custom was brought back into play. You, of course, would have to disguise yourself very well since you're so well known. I am pleading with you, whilst there is still time, to use your influence to try to persuade the Prime Minister to hold a second referendum, which is the only democratic, fair and just way out of this constitutional crisis. It is not against your duty as monarch to ask her or him to do this, but on the contrary, it is directly and properly in your direct right and line of duty to ask her to do this. Your subjects would love you forever if this were to happen and breathe a huge sigh of relief. All the polls show that the UK would then not leave the EU after all. The economy would gradually restore itself and the lives of countless millions of people would be restored to their own sovereignty and happiness. A very small number of Brexit fanatics would be disappointed, but frankly, they're not the sort of people one would want round for tea. And one should certainly not be afraid of such extremist types. That is why, after all, we have police and intelligence services and laws <coughs> to protect us from such fanatics. There is, however, another possibility here. It is just possible that you yourself have been persuaded by advisers, friends, family, etc. that the UK should indeed leave the EU as soon as possible. And that once we leave, everything can then settle down and go back to normal. And that the people of Scotland will simply accept this and the people of Northern Ireland can be made to accept it. If necessary, by troops once more on the streets of Belfast. It is possible that it is your intention to force Brexit on the people of the UK and turn it into a personal loyalty conundrum. Quote, if you're loyal to me as Queen, then you must accept Brexit. If not, you're a traitor. End of quotes. Is this possibly the case? If so, then, with all due respect, I can only repeat that you've been catastrophically badly advised. The people of Scotland only very narrowly voted to remain in the UK and largely only because they were told they would automatically be thrown out of the EU if they left the UK. Now, this is reversed entirely. Likewise with the people of Northern Ireland. I would put it to you, therefore, that for your good, as well as for your heirs and successors, you would be advised to do all you can to immediately prevent Brexit happening by advising your Prime Minister to hold a second referendum and to enact the necessary legislation at once to make this possible. Finally, if you are convinced by the veracity of my words, and I swear on the throne of all the gods and goddesses that I am speaking 100% truthfully to you, 
then you have one last constitutional procedure open to you. You can threaten to the Prime Minister to abdicate rather than signing the final legislation to enable the UK to leave the EU. You can say that in all conscience you cannot and will not tolerate this act to take place under your reign and therefore you will abdicate unless a second referendum is called. Finally, if the Prime Minister refuses to back down in private, you can go public with this threat. And I believe the vast mass of the British people would be supporting you in this brave and defiant act of common sense. Millions of people would surround Buckingham Palace to support you. We love you as our Queen, we love the UK, but we also love Europe and, and its European Union. We do not want to be tortured anymore by the Brexit nightmare. Yours truthfully, loyally and advisedly, Dr Thomas Clough Daffer. Right, so that's the letter I wrote back in January, at the very beginning of this year, when I first started my weekly fasting and recordings. Now, sad to say, I've never had a reply to that letter. Um... <clears throat> which is, I think, unfortunate. Um, and also, um, obviously, events have moved on. But I think the gist of that letter is still valid. And although I know we've had this general election where you could argue, well, it's all been superseded because the Tories have now got this majority and so on, I think everything I say in that letter is still valid because the Tories, although they got a, a majority in the House of Commons, that's only because of a, um, you know, a a uh, non-representative uh, political system. The Actually, only a quarter of the uh, electorate, registered electorate, voted for the Conservatives at this last election. Um, and the uh, majority of voters either didn't vote for them or they just abstained. <clears throat> and then um, another lot of voters just um, yeah, weren't, weren't registered and so on. So a quarter of, of the, the voters uh, only um, gave a green light to the Conservative MPs that are now implying they're going to push this Brexit thing forward. Um, so we live in a very strange world where democracy is, is manipulatable. <clears throat> and also there's the question of, of how was that election won? Uh, well, obviously with vast um, resources thrown at the um, <clears throat> the um, the media, through the media, at the um, anti-Labour, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, hysteria that was thrown up. Um, so, I'm going to come back to that point in my phone call, I, I think, um, shortly. So anyway, that's the state of play. That's the last correspondence I've had with the, with the Queen, Her Majesty, who I have always respected and... You know, I respect her intelligence, and I'm I'm going to be ringing her shortly. Um, as as coordinator of this Commonwealth Common Values Council, I'm concerned from a Commonwealth-wide perspective at the impact of Brexit. I've just come back from India, um, and you know, there's there's fighting on the streets of Delhi because of causes and and factors that are not unconnected with Brexit. This, this this kind of nationalist populism that, that Brexit represents. We're seeing it everywhere, and I think it's very unfortunate. It's not what the Commonwealth stands for. It's not what my country, Canada, stands for. It's not what I thought the UK stood for. I'm appalled at what, what has become of my country, the UK. So anyway, there's that's the state of play. I'm going to not say any more. I, I might comment at the end. I'm now going to ring the palace. We've booked this call, and the time, I think, is perfect for that. The alarm went off a minute ago, so, yeah, they'll be expecting my call now. Right, bear with me. And, um, yeah. <clears throat> ah, hello, yes, uh, greetings, yes. Is that the uh, private number of the... Um, Private Secretary to Her Majesty. Hello, yes, it is it is Thomas Daffin here. Yeah, Dr. Thomas Daffin. We, we, did, we did agree that I would ring at this time. So, yeah, it's Sunday afternoon. It's five o'clock. Um, 
and I hope all is well. Hello. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Do put me through. I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted and honoured that you found time to arrange this. <clears throat> ah, uh, hello, greetings. Yes, Your Majesty, hello. <laughs> it, is, it is Thomas Daffin here speaking, yes. Um, th thank you so much for agreeing to speak to me. This is a great honour. Um, we've never really had a chance to talk in personal. I feel we have in the past. <laughs> yes, I, I did speak to your husband at, at, uh, on one, a very important occasion for me, and I did come to that um, Commonwealth Interfaith Observance, which was very memorable. Well, well, thank you. Yes, I have been trying my best to fly the flag for the Commonwealth. Uh, I'm, as you know, a dual British-Canadian citizen. I've always... Yeah, I love, you know, I love the Commonwealth. I've always respected... And I've always really honoured the role you've played ever since becoming Queen. Um, yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I went to... Yeah. Well, I was brought up in Montreal in Canada, and then we, we went to Brighton in Sussex when I was a little boy. Yeah, I, I went to briefly to Brighton College Junior School where we have a photograph actually of you visiting the school of Brighton College. And my brother was then um, studying there and there's, you were a young, young queen at the time. Um, yes, I love Brighton College. It's where I learned, I suppose, values. You see, in schools like that, you get taught values as well as just facts. Okay, yeah, the, yeah. I know um, you, you and your family have always understood the importance of these values. Um, and so, yes, one learns. I think truthfulness was one of the key values I learned. Integrity, um, courage, um, imagination. You know, I mean, to me, they're all joined up. It's, I know we have separate words for them, but it's more a sort of attitude. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, yes. So <clears throat> that's why I've always taken taken this work quite seriously. Um, it's always been an honour to be one of your citizens, as it were, both in Canada and... And yes, I went back to Canada in my 20s and worked in Alberta, which I love, the province. Yeah, as you know, it's named after one of your ancestors, um, the youngest daughter of, of Queen, Queen Victoria. Um, yeah. And she met her husband, the son of the Duke of Argyll, in the castle I lived at later in, in Scotland. So it's weird, isn't it? Life is about spirals and, and spirals of um, interconnectedness. I, I feel I've been doing a kind of dance around the fate of the House of Windsor. <laughs> um, yeah, and, that, and, and really that's why I, I've got involved in this whole business. Um, that's why I set up the Commonwealth Common Values Council, really. That's my first point. I'd like to just talk about that briefly. Uh, yes, thank you so much, yes. So I want to give you a little update, because we've not really talked about this before, but I've just returned from Delhi in India, a wonderful city. I know India very well. I've been about 11 times now. I, I kind of feel almost like an Indian citizen. Um, the Indians are wonderful people, but they're suffering. There's a problem in India. Now, I know you will have your own sources on this, but I want to bring you up to speed. There have been riots in, in dozens of cities throughout India. It's catastrophe. Um, because the, the, the government there, this BJP, which is a nationalist party, it's a kind of populist India for the Hindus type party. Yeah, and it's got links to the people that actually killed Gandhi, right? And they, they are sort of Hindu fascists. There's this thing called the RSS. These people actually liked Hitler. They thought Hitler was a good bloke. Yeah, I mean, what, what on earth? I, 